Objective Truth. Well, why don't you start the show and tell everyone what we're drinking? Welcome to the Stiff Truth. I'm Scott Castelnova, and with me is kind of an uppity Bob West today, uh, but we like that with our Bobs. How you doing, Bob? I'm doing good. I, I don't know why I'm uppity, so I'm curious. <laughs> I, I mean, I've I got just, some ideas, but <laughs> I just thought I'd come out of the gate with that bad boy. Um, it is a beautiful Sunday, a little bit of a sad Sunday in the football world. Um, Washington Commanders lost a, a, I'll say a heartbreaker, Bob. It was just, it wasn't even a good win, a good win for the Minnesota Vikings. I thought it was ugly. I thought it was low class. Um, and, and quite frankly, fuck Kirk Cousins. Okay. I bet he's like walking around with a little smirk on his face right now after the game, thinking, you know, everybody's giving like that a boy. He didn't do shit, but get sacked. That's all I got to say. But besides that, it's also the Sunday before Election Day coming up here on Tuesday. And we were just chatting about it, Bob. I, I went ahead and turned in my ballot the other day, um, Saturday, actually yesterday. Both me and Jamie dropped those bad boy off. Um, you guys are, are holding it for the in-person, doing it the conservative way, I see. Well, we're going to early vote in person. Oh, how? okay. So are you going when? Tomorrow. Okay. So you're going to vote Monday. So you have a little bit of that way. You're giving everybody that wants to be devious and deceptive at least a good 24 hours to do so. Well, that and we get the, the extra day to drive by and like see if there's any like masked arm crusaders out there because uh-huh. that's important to know. <laughs> I, I laugh but that's just a nervous laugh i mean yes it's great <laughs> Goodness, i laugh because uh, uh, that's like how <laughs> russians vote <laughs> yeah, yeah no, i'll tell you what but i mean at speaking of the election got a lot of got a lot of things to talk about today about the election a couple other things here but we, we talked about it a little bit already this is a tasty drink i'll say this be it a summer drink perchance i don't know i don't know if you i don't know if you always want to pigeonhole drinks to a season but it, it feels like a good summertime drink but it's not super cold right now so i'm enjoying it what do you think about this lovely cocktail i think this is a fourth of july drink let's like get in there and get specific about it mm-hmm. you get these are american american graffitis Oh. Um, I went ahead and threw a couple of cherries in there, just, you know, as per the instructions. It says the lemon and cherries, I think it said, but I just went with cherries. But uh, mm-hmm. it's definitely like a like a cherry limeade type of a drink, right? It's a it's like a sweet and tart. Um, I even told Scott it tastes like a candy sweet tart. He said more like a Jolly Rancher. Mm-hmm. Uh, either way, definitely tastes like a candy, but it is quite boozy. Uh, so it, it's not a punk bitch drink. There is a Excuse me. There's a couple of ounces of booze in there, so um, it is a it is a good drink. But yeah, a, definitely a summer drink, and I would pin it even farther than that. I think this is like a staple at your Fourth of July party. I agree. Now, I will say this: Isn't American Graffiti like a musical from the seventies? I, I want to say that sound or like think a it's play a musical. Let me see what it is. But I think it has like uh, it's something. I know. I'm not it's a very been so smart long man. since I've seen it. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Study of cruising. Uh, the film is a study of cruising and early rock and roll c- cultures popular among. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's not. It's not a. It's not a musical. It's about music. That's where I was kind of. I knew. I knew something. I haven't. I haven't seen it to be honest. It's got Ron Howard in it. Harrison Ford. Richard Drivers. Jesus Christ. Maybe I should watch this movie. But anyways, it, it was interesting when you. When you found this drink, obviously we want to have we wanted to have something patriotic themed, right? Something to do with America. It's voting time, baby. This is when we get out there and show our patriotic chops. But um, I, for, I in the back of my head, I was like, why does that sound so familiar? Now, have you seen this movie? I I I don't know, and if I have, it's been so long that I've forgotten. Uh, well, yeah, you know, be it, be it that I think it's know, whatever. Yeah, I think we're gonna definitely have to check it out, but. but Regardless of that, we're going to give a fresh 50 year old review of American Griffin coming up on the next (laughs) of truth. Spoiler alert. No, (laughs) but um, back to the drink, though. You're right. This is this is not super punk bitch. It's it's kind of like right there in the uh, in the zone. Right. It's like right. It's it's a good, happy median there between a, a lighter drink and a super, super dang drink. We'll say that because it's um it's two ounces of booze. It's a half ounce of light rum, dark rum um 
Southern Comfort and mm-hmm. Slow Gin. Slow. Are... And I'll tell you what, I'll say this. When we use the Slow Gin, it always gives it that nice, like, vibrant red color. I mean, it's it's like a purplish kind of, you know, liqueur or whatever. But when you add it to other stuff, we made another drink with Slow Gin. We made a couple of drinks with Slow Gin, if I remember correctly. But once I poured it in and I gave it a little shake, 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 I was like, oh, Look at that beautiful color. So I think that's why I went Jolly Rancher, because it kind of reminds me of like a watermelon Jolly Rancher by color, not really by taste with the watermelon. You know what I mean? But but damn, after that, a splash, it says, of sweetened lime juice and then fill with equal parts pineapple juice and sour mix and then shake that bitch like I know it's sad, but just like later. Catherine years. Hepburn. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you know, you know, later year, Michael J. Fox is not looking too good out there, but he does shake a mean cocktail. And this is a dandy. I do like it. But you're right. I I, I, I like the pin down. I don't like to, like, put things in a box, but I think we have these at our fourth, uh, fourth of July get down, which we, we will definitely have next year. Yeah, um, I think everyone will love them and I'll be happy to turn everyone on to them. Um. I think they're great drinks. They're something that everyone can drink. Once again, uh, we we do like to find drinks that your more hardcore boozers will drink, and also the people that don't like hardcore boozy drinks will also drink. So, can I say this? We're sellouts. We are sellouts. We're trying to please everybody here with our cocktails that we mix up, and we always think like, how can we please the masses? How can we be everyone's friend at the party, right? And and that's what we're looking to do. We're really looking to appease everybody here, and I think this one nails it, bro. Because again, you can taste the booze, but you also it's got that like wine cooler esque, very easy sippability for the for the lightweights. Am I right? Hey, I say you throw an umbrella in this thing and you drink this thing on the top deck of the cruise ship. Nuff it's said. that kind of a drink. Nuff said. Am I right? <laughs> I agree with you a hundred percent, sir. Well, I'll tell you what exciting stuff going on here definitely want to get into some political stuff in the sense that there's there's just a lot going on before we touch on that we've had a couple of big things this lasting now now one is just rumor mill totally rumor mill in the sense of like it's not actually taking place but there has been confirmation from dan schneider and also the washington commander's front office that Listen to this, folks. Everybody out there, all two of us in in Stiffy World, me and somebody else out there, I know there's got to be another fan. It looks like our piece of shit owner is entertaining the idea of selling the team, which is like, you know, 30 years too late. But goddamn, what do you think about this, Bob? Have you heard any rumblings about this? Uh, I I think that his his wife's comment about the Redskins was just like the, the last straw. He was just like, you know what? We just always keep sticking our foot in our mouth here and keep getting like fucked over for it. Let's just let's just cut our losses and get our three billion dollar profit and 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 sell this team and walk, march out of here. Because if I if I if I'm correct, it's valued around five or six billion right now, and it's the sixth most valuable sports franchise in the world. Right. So, which is odd with how much we <laughs> lose, but yes, yes, it, it's it's historic and it goes back a long way, right? Um, so, but when you when you sell a business, right, you you sell it for its you know its valuation, but then you also sell it as a certain percentage of profits over the next several years. So I'm not going to be surprised if the Redskins fetch a price tag around seven or eight billion dollars. You know, Bob, one thing I love about what you've just done there is you've said Redskins past three times you've mentioned the team name. And and I love that about you. (laughs) Don't let go of the past, you know, America. uh, And that is truly one of America's original teams. And and I I like what you did there. But, yeah, no, I agree. I think I think this is overdue. I think even for Schneider, who's like such a fucking stubborn piece of shit about stuff. I mean, rightfully so. I was kind of proud of him for like the 10, 15 years that he was getting a lot of guff to change the name. And he just kind of like, you know, he stood his grounds like, no, we're not changing the name. Uh, But like, then he's really stubborn with everything else. And like, you know, he's a really shitty owner. He's one of those overreach type of owners that like tries to get in there and be involved with the team on an operational level Try to be a player personnel GM and all that. And he has no idea what he's doing. I mean, I'll I'll just say this. I'm probably a better like operational like front office guy for Washington than him. And that, that really doesn't say a whole lot. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I think it I think I think um 
I think one of the big things in my mind that what's going on recently is Jim Ursay. You know him, the owner of the Colts. Of course, yeah. He, he's the one that came out and said and insinuated that that it makes sense for for Schneider to sell the team to go ahead and step down. And he kind of insinuated that this is not just an independent opinion for me. This is like an opinion of me and my peers as owners. The the and, way that it sounded, Scott, was that he had already had the majority of owners ready to vote him out. Right, because you don't say that to like a reporter without kind of conferring. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. Jim Ursay is kind of a piece of shit, too, if you know anything about Jim Ursay. Um, but at well, the same I mean, time, he's a billionaire. So <laughs> I'm going to say that the majority of billionaires are pieces of shit. Touche, uh, Bobby. Touche. <laughs> no, you don't I'm... get to that level without fucking people over. <laughs> you just don't. <laughs> <laughs> Except for Jim Ursay, he wrote the book how to how to get to the top like organically and genuinely as a good person. Yeah, no. Um. So it's interesting. I I tell you I tell you one thing. He sells the team. I want to just go down hypothetical road here for a minute because here's here's what I would love to see happen. He sells the team. He rolls back whoever whoever takes over first order business. Roll back the the stupid new name and then go with Washington Warriors. Just 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 lean head first into it still being remotely about native american pride because i think that's an okay thing and let's face it that's why the redskins were named the redskins they were honoring somebody one of the original people that helped created a team that was a native american i say they go ahead and lean into that have a much better name rolls right off the tongue and i say they don't really change much on the uniforms i like the new uniforms they look pretty sharp but instead of that stupid w throw that arrow back on there the old school arrow that they used to have and call it a fucking day well that's what i, I say i love your idea and um I, I really want them to sell it. I, I love the Warriors name and keeping the old logo stuff. You mm -hmm. know, um, <clears throat> uh, you can get rid of the headdress, but just go with like an arrow, uh, something simple, like kind of like Florida State style, right? Um, mm -hmm. Something go mm -hmm. there. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think about opening it up and uh, giving a, um, a black majority owner an opportunity to be the first NFL black majority owner. I've heard that tossed around a few of the talking head shows in ESPN. And, and I thought that that's a great idea because there's, there's black billionaires out there that are interested and they've kind of been stonewalled out of the NFL. And uh, I thought that that would be a great idea. Um, I think it was Keyshawn Johnson that was talking about it. He's like, Washington's a great place to do it. Just from the demographics of the city, I think the city mm -hmm. would really latch onto that and, and be really open and accepting, and it would get a lot of support from the city behind them. And, and I say him. I, I just assume uh, <laughs> that well, it might be a, a male owner, but maybe it's a female owner. They, they exist. Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, let's, I mean, just speaking plainly here, I, besides Capitol Hill, which is unfortunate, I think Washington, D.C. and most of Maryland is majority African-American. You know what I mean? And the grand scheme of things, too. I think it makes sense. The other thing that I saw kicked around, which I thought was pretty cool, I think I've I think I read Jay-Z, but I, I know for sure I read that Kevin Durant has come out and said that he wanted to put some money down on ownership. Um, kind of as like a almost like a partnership with other people. Like hell, I'd I'd, I'd go in there and buy the commanders. I'm like that. I, I I like that. Honestly, dude, they would stay out of like the day to day operations of, of like course. what's what's going on, and they would just enjoy the profits that they would make or the losses, whatever. But at least they're at least I've heard some some pretty cool rumblings of some pretty marquee big name people in the sports world and music world and what have you that that wanna that want to like throw some money into this team and, and throw some investment behind it. I think that's pretty sweet. And if they're smart, they would stay out of it. Right. Um, yeah. um, unless you made your billions um, through player personnel management in the NFL, you should probably <laughs> not try to become a professional at something that you've never done and just hire someone that is a, a consummate professional at, at player personnel and, and managing a team. Um, I, I think that's, part of the reason the Cowboys are doing better is because over the years that Jerry Jones kind of let Steven take over and backed away from that so much. Uh, and, and, and we'll see, you know, uh, I think, I think owners that get involved with their teams like that do poorly. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I, I, I think the only example that's not was maybe Steinbrenner for the Yankees. Uh, yeah, and for a long true. time, Steinbrenner's Yankees teams weren't very good, but then they had a magical run for like a yeah. decade where they just won like every other year. Right. So, mm -hmm. and, and he was involved a lot with the player personnel purchases and, and who to go after and all that. And, but typically that's not very common 
Um, yeah, it's a, it's an that's an outlier right there. You know right. what I mean? It's an outlier with the with the the most winning dynasty in all of sports. So I mean, that can't really you can't really say much there. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah no. Uh, <clears throat> another billionaire that's been making news, Scott. And I hope for your sake they do sell the team because uh, we're just we're done with Dan Snyder. I I'm sure you are as a fan. Like uh, everyone's done with Dan Snyder. Yeah, yeah. Let's just move on, mm-hmm. right? But um. So Elon finally bought Twitter. Goddamn right. He did right? cleaning the house over there too. fired about 30, 40% of the staff, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. is, I think a little bit ill-conceived considering he literally has no like uh, analysis performed of the company yet. <laughs> He's just like, let's just immediately cut staff to, to, to gain, you know, profitability, more profitable, right, right away. And because that's how you can do it, but then you're you're you know creating a terrible culture, all this. So we'll see how that goes. But um, now he just mentioned that he's he's looking to to monetize everything in Twitter, um, even more so than YouTube. So he's he's wanting to uh, lure creators over to post their content on Twitter. He's talking about an eight dollar a month monthly fee to mm-hmm. subscribe to Twitter as a user. And I gotta say, I barely use Twitter, and it's free. <laughs> yeah, no, same, same here. I, I really don't, I really don't find any value in Twitter. In fact, I deleted the, um, the app off my home screen, but I still get like some of the notifications because it's not something I deleted completely off my phone and it kind of annoys me. Uh, but at this, I, I just don't get a lot of value out of it at all. I, it's interesting to see what happens. You know, the one thing I think is pretty, pretty telling too with just, I guess the mass layoffs not being that much of a surprise or that illogical, even for like other people is, did you see the tweet from Jack Dorsey? I think yesterday or the day before that's the old CEO, right? Yes. And he, the guy that like created it to, who's the creator CEO and then kind of, you know, faded away. He, I think he still has like a billion dollars in the company of ownership, which is again, versus 44 billion it's a very small percentage but still a pretty heavy stakeholder in the grand scheme of things but he was basically apologizing to the workers at twitter saying that this is kind of my fault in the sense that we grew too quickly and i would kind of that he added too many people to to a large degree and like kind of maybe devalued and took away a little bit of the profit that they could have had if he would have just maybe done that a little bit more smartly. So it was, it was an interesting comment. It was kind of vague. You know what I mean? It wasn't like an op-ed or anything like that explaining his, his apology, but I thought that was a little bit just interesting in general. I was like, huh? Yeah. Okay. Do you so know he's... their total uh, workforce? I think it was seven or 9,000. There's a lot of people, a lot of people to run a shitty app. If you ask me, that's all I'm saying. Right. You well, just I mean? the whole platform, right? It screams yeah. boomer, right? And this, <laughs> to me, like I, I don't, I don't like Twitter because I, I, I I'm more of a, you know, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok kind of a person myself. I don't even like Facebook. Uh, well, you're young at heart. Let's just face it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I think that Facebook's kind of boomerang. And then when I talk to my son, like the only reason he has a Facebook is because of family. And he's like, his friends don't use that. They don't even use phone numbers, dude. They just Snapchat each other. They don't text each other or call each other very often. It's all it's all Snapchat conversations. And, and that's their app of choice. And and I think he's trying to make make it more relevant, or I think he's got ideas right now. I think he's brainstorming and trying to figure out how to turn this thing around and 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 into something positive. Because I think and what happened was Elon was making a lot of money before most of the inflation started hitting. Right, the stock market was doing good. It was right after Biden was elected. Um, we had uh, that that pump from the 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 last couple of years of the Trump. Uh, administration come into the economy, which fake or not, we talked about that. You can look it up yeah. on a previous show, but but it, it existed nonetheless. And the economy yeah. was doing really well. And then his his stock and Tesla stock was doing really well. SpaceX Dude, it, had landed a bunch of contracts. His, it jetted his, fortune, his 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 stock like in 2020 to like 2021, Jetta pulled him to be like the richest man in the world. You know what right. I mean? And 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 by some accounts, the richest man in the history of the world. Yeah. Right. So yeah. so. You know, he he went up from a ninety billion dollars to like two hundred fifty billion dollars, right? All of a sudden, and then he's like Mister Big Swing and Dick, right? And then he's just like, oh well, the people are like, uh, you know, censoring politicians out of Twitter. I would do something about it if I owned it. And then I think he got caught up with his own bullshit, 
And then he like got so brazen as to put an offer in. But as soon as he put an offer in, like no shit, within a couple of weeks, his stock starts tanking severely. And then all of a sudden he's down like $50 billion from his previous net worth. And he's like, well, maybe I don't want to buy this company for $44 billion. That's now a huge risk of my overall net worth and portfolio. And he mm-hmm. wants to back out, but he's already locked in because he's already made the offer uh, of a stock. I think it was, a, I forget what they call it. It's like a stock tenure a tenured offer or something basically when he's just offering a full fucking buyout right and and, uh and now it's already in now it now Mm -hmm. they can hold him to it and they did right so then i think he had to go through it but now he's trying to figure out what the fuck he's going to do with it now that he Mm -hmm. had to buy it yeah well and and i looked it up too so by in 2021 um the company of twitter grew to 7,500 employees that's a lot that's a lot of employees. Mm-hmm. And what looks like on Friday, um, out of the 7,500, um, 3,700, 3,700 so were fired. Half, half. Basically, he, he went Thanos on Twitter. Yeah, he, he, he snapped his fucking fingers. He's like, <laughs> he's like, hey, Twitter. Let's 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 go ahead and, and and just let's trim the fat. Literally, let's just trim. Everything. I'm going to keep a couple extra janitorial staff to clean up all these ashes, though. Yeah, you're right, right. <laughs> um, and somebody to walk around and hand out tissues to everybody else. Jesus Christ, that's a lot of people, man. I mean, literally. The co- now, now, here's what's going to be interesting to see because, again, to some out there, to the non-Elon haters, he is hailed as a very innovative, forward-thinking genius. So, be it that it you know, that he's done this and what seemed to be like almost like a pump fake idea that he got pulled into regardless that he couldn't change. Let's see what happens. Cause again, he could just be t- tanking the fucking ship cause he can. Right. right. And just be you know, like, dude, I'm just going to gut this fucking bitch and, and see what happens. Like the worst case. Yeah. The worst case scenario here is at least we'll be in the green after I fire half of the staff for a hot minute Yeah, with toxic culture or not. You know what I mean? So well, employee payroll is your number one expense. Yeah. hundred percent. So, so he's a right there. Real smart guy. See the genius working over. <laughs> now, now can he turn it into a platform that, you know, kind of accomplishes the goal that he's been bloviating about uh on twitter for the last couple of years you know uh that if i own twitter they would do this and that you know uh we'll see it's time for him to put his money where his mouth is he got caught um uh, kind of got caught with his pants down uh, twitter called his bluff except that his offer wait wait is there a video of that he got caught with his <laughs> pants down Hold on. No, must... oh i'm sorry was that a that was a euphemism oh man hey um but seriously, though, do you know do you know his justification and why he he fired everybody? Because this is interesting, I think, too. And then I and I wanted to kind of put this out there and have a little bit of dialogue about it. Right? We all know the reason why he had the notion of 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 buying Twitter in the first place is because there was too much censorship. There's too much moderation. But that that was essentially it. He he basically said, I just looked it up to that the the workforce was too large. That's something that Jack Dorsey agreed to with his apology. Right. Like, look, we grew the we grew the workforce too much too quickly. And I apologize about that because even if it wasn't Musk, any smart CEO would probably say we need to downsize. Maybe not as dramatically as Musk, but call it what it is. One fourth of 70, uh, you know, 7,500 is still a lot of people. You know what I mean? So even even a fraction of what he did would still be very dramatic for a lot of people's lives. But he basically said that the large a large part of their workforce, why it was too big is there was way too many content moderators. Uh, moderators. Um, so and and that's basically what he wanted to get rid of in the first place with taking over. Right. So there, there was too many hands in the cookie jar nitpicking what people were saying and 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 canceling people and removing them and and blocking them whatever right so that was his big thing he's like but i have a hard time now maybe i'm wrong i don't have any any stats in front of me or any information i'm totally just speaking uh, like from the hip here and that's why we love it scott (laughs) but I have a hard time believing that 3700 employees at twitter are just content moderators they're not you know what i mean that's because they're not there, there it doesn't it doesn't take someone to do any sort of uh employee analytics to know that he probably fired a, a good chunk of coders a good chunk of qa people well, uh to check code uh you know a, a good chunk of management 
a good chunk of everyone. I mean, like I said, he went Thanos. I bet he well, skeleton crewed it like skeleton crewed it by half, and he took over the the company. It's a hostile takeover, and then he he trimmed it all out. It was very Mitt Romney of him. Interesting, nicely done. Um, <laughs> let let me let me ask you this: How do you think he made the decisions on who to cut and who not? Was this done literally? by like some ridiculous random algorithm or did he take tenure production? Um, did he just pick people's names that he didn't like? I mean, I, I want to know when you trim 3,700 people from a, when you trim like over half of the staff, how do you make the determinations who's worthy of staying in your skeleton crew versus who I, needs I'm going to say this. He probably told all the directors to uh, do it have yourselves, your, have your management cut them in half. Yeah. And the managers then had to go and decide at your discretion. Uh, you know your can, team. Who can yeah. get rid of who and how we can survive with just half the staff? What would we do? And I'm sure if that's the way that it's done. And then you're not the bad guy, right? Your managers are. Oh, so yeah, I know what he says. Like, hey, hey guys, you, first first boardroom meeting with them is like, so I want you to I want you to go talk to your manager and say, Hey, if you guys were on a stranded island, which half of your employees would you would you keep there and why? And I want you to use that mindset and that strategy to go fucking can everybody <laughs> like Jesus Christ. I, it's, it, it may be, it may be something that simple. It, it is interesting. What would we say? Whether well, bye So Twitter. here's the thing. It, and to some extent, it's less risky than it sounds from his perspective. Yeah. He can always ramp back up and hire more people. And then he's creating jobs. Oh, right? then, then he can start tweeting about how he's expanding and creating jobs and the business is doing so good. Because well, you just have this one negative and then all the rest can be positive. All positive that's spin. A, that's exactly what the Biden administration did coming up from the pandemic. All 100%. of a sudden he's creating all the jobs and Biden's responsible. I was like, no, all the jobs, the had... most jobs in any president in history. Yeah. It's like, yeah, cause they existed to create. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you, you literally had a pandemic lose, you know, it's the, it's the catalyst to lose everything. You're just, you're just putting back that what already should have been there. But no, I, I agree. I agree. But here's the other thing too. Last year, um, Twitter lost $221 million lost in the, in the red. So that's pretty bad. So something had to happen, bro. I mean, let's just come in blind here real quick. You you are now the big swinging dick of Twitter. That's right. Bob Musk. I know. It's kind of nice, right? Almost sounds like it should be like a deodorant. <laughs> we got Bobby Musk over here. What are you going to do, Bob? How many people are you going to fire? Are you going to take a different angle? I want to know. Honestly, I, I, I'm going to fire the more expensive crew, the older people, and bring in a bunch of young people. <laughs> the only Bob fires all. It's all Bobby Musk fires all the boomers. And and I bet you anything, that's kind of the approach that the management took it. So you got to figure, as someone with 20 years, they can code the shit out of something, right? And they've seen it all. The code has evolved. They can like write several different languages. But at the end, they are also twice as expensive as someone that's five years out of college. Um, and they don't have the experience and they can't get over the hump, but you have to lean on your, your management and your quality assurance people to kind of, to kind of get you there. And that's why I'm saying, uh, I, I, I guaranteed he left it to his management and they started trimming the most expensive. Cause if you cut the most expensive person on the team, you could probably save two of the least expensive people. Right. Yep. And, well, and your own job. I mean. That makes sense. Older people are the higher risk, not only because they typically have more tenure and demand higher pay, but they've also got just higher liability and higher costs when it comes to health care and otherwise. I yeah, mean, it's but really although that slow and dangerous behind the wheel, <laughs> they can still serve a purpose. <laughs> <laughs> they can run for president. <laughs> they fuck yeah, they can. Way up into their eighties, apparently. Jesus Christ. Well, we will see what happens with uh, with Twitter. But you brought up a great point here. We got we got Biden on the campaign trail. We've got Hillary Clinton on the campaign trail. We've got Obama on the campaign trail. We've got a lot of Democrats pulling out all the stops right now to make some moves and not lose position in the House and the Senate. Bob, I wanted to bring something to your attention that I'm not sure you know or not. I and I hope I get this figure right. I, I saw it. I saw it the other day. I I, I want to look it up, but I'm I'm, I'm probably just going to shoot from the hip here. Because I know it was in the billions, but did you know that there was literally this year, I want to say over two billion dollars that were spent on political ads for this for this election campaign or this this cycle? Can you believe that fucking shit, dude? No, of course I can, dude. Um, it's it's about the control of the biggest economic power in the world. 
of course of course there's going to be money funneling in from all angles there's going to be money funneling money funneling in from some from super PACs who as of now don't have to answer who gave it to them <laughs> they can just give it to their candidates and it could have come from anywhere any any corporation or government in in the world uh we've got corporations funding people we've got shit we've got trump just raising money off of january 6th in uh, uh investigations mm -hmm. I, I you get emails from trump saying hey help me fight this but then he gets he's raised like like i don't know two or three hundred million dollars uh to campaign with and he hasn't actually helped any of the the republican senate or house members with that money and he hasn't declared that he's running yet at all be mindful look, he gets to keep that money himself all he has to do is claim it as income tax and pay his whatever the fuck tax on that and that's his money which by all accounts is the most business success he's ever had in his whole business adult life I just sent you I sent you a link in the chat, too. But yes, I was way off in the sense that it was way more. But this election cycle here, they have spent combined the GOP and the Democrats have spent sixteen point seven billion dollars, dude. And the the the, the Republicans have, have slight, slightly outspent um, the Democrats here. But that's just because they're trying to take things back. But it is interesting. They they literally are putting. Here's what <clears throat> here's what spoke to me when I heard these figures, Bob. Um we're always trying to get money for taxes for certain things. We're always trying to help out the homeless. We're always trying to fund the military. We're always trying to pay off debt that we for money we don't have. And yet we can find $16.7 billion to try to put the people in the seats that we want. It's interesting to me. We should tax uh, campaign money yeah. and churches. And give that give that those taxes back to the people. It's it, it's a people's tax. It literally goes back to us. On <laughs> how much honored. would that that would eliminate basically like hunger in America? It's crazy, Completely. man. It's just well, crazy. Just like, let's just say there was a twenty percent tax. So there's sixteen billion dollars, right? That's three point two billion dollars that we could just divert and feed children with. And poor families and single mothers and and all this stuff like uh, it, it doesn't make sense how we run our country mm -hmm. like it, we run it like such shit dude it, it, we run it like elon runs twitter we just wing <laughs> it and hope for the best <laughs> now 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 he's only he's only been in the he's only been in his office for like less than a week man give him some time <laughs> give him some time he may turn this ship around bob um but no, that you're 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 absolutely right. You're speaking the truth here in the sense that this just um the priorities just seem a little bit out of whack here. But it is interesting to me because the other thing that speaks to me here, Bob, if you if you kind of peel this back a little bit here, this is not people just throwing money at shit for no reason. These are investments from a lot of people around around the country that have a vested interest in either people keeping power that have power or overthrowing people that have power to put their people in power. Oh, Scott, this no is, one this wants is... anything for that money. It's all about patriotism uh, right. and yeah. the direction of the country. <laughs> It's very unselfish and and, 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 here. and all about the, all about the betterment of our country. No one wants anything in return for their half a billion dollar donation. I don't. <laughs> I don't like what you did there, Bob. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's true, but it's crazy. It's literally there's that much motivation, and it makes sense because you know what that means to me too, Bob. Is if if we're willing to throw up let's just call it close to $20 billion to keep the people in power that we want in power for our own selfish interest. Then there's probably 10 times that amount at play with potential investment or loss from these same individuals. That's what that means to me. You know what I mean? Um, and that's pretty nutty because you know how much came out of my pocket for the elections? Fucking zero, maybe negative dollars, right? Or I take that back. I did drive my car over to drop off our ballots. So whatever that was about, well, Biden's in office. So a little bit more than it would have been if it was true. <laughs> I'm an asshole. It's a, it costs me about 35 cents to drive those over to the drop off box. But that's my investment, Bob. What about you? Did you donate to any campaigns? Hmm? No, 
No, no and and I and I don't think I'm allowed to donate to campaigns, to be honest with you. Pray tell. Why is that? Uh, well, because um because of my my position as a government contractor. Really? I don't quite think I'm allowed huh. to actually donate money to political campaigns. I'd have to double check that, but if I remember uh, off the top of my head, I'm pretty sure that's how it is. So you can't you can't grease any wheels, huh? Interesting. No. Uh, that's too bad. Well, you can grease. They can grease wheels. mine up to twenty five dollars. I can't accept well, anything larger than a twenty five dollar gift card or or gift. <laughs> my goodness. Well, let's so, let, let me... so naturally that we get twenty five dollar gift cards or whatever for Christmas parties. It's pretty lame. Let me ask you this, Bob. There's a lot of crazy races out there. I'm looking at some of the key ones right now. It, obviously, Georgia is is on everybody's mind. Can you fucking – here, here's what I'm going to say. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say this too. I have not done a deep dive on Herschel Walker's political um, political life. thought he was pretty great uh, as, as, a, as a football player. Fantastic I'll say that. Fantastic. Great guy. Georgia Bulldog too. Great guy. Um, but – um, it's crazy that he's neck and neck with with who is he? Um, Reverend Warnock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like how how is that? Yeah, Raphael Warnock, Herschel Walker. The last I checked, this, they are less than like a point away from each other. With Walker ahead of Warnock. What's going on here, bud? What's really happening, man? Have you listened to him speak, though? And I'm not going to just say he's got hit in the head way too much, but I think he's got hit in the head way too much. Do you know what I mean? Uh, Yeah, I think he's an idiot. Uh, <laughs> I mean, just Tell I'm us, not even going to pull any punches here. I don't think he's a very smart individual. Uh, I, I, I think he's just kind of half cocked all the time. I don't think he I, I think they keep him from speaking. <laughs> and and the things, the dumbass things he says are the opportunities that he has to speak about something. But I think for the most part, uh, the GOP keeps him from speaking. Uh, he's just he's just not a very bright guy. He doesn't have a very high IQ. He's not 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 a very bright guy. But even then, um, he's still probably going to win this race. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. But uh, don't underestimate uh, the. Uh, the state of Georgia. I mean, uh, it, <laughs> Jesus, Bob. We going? <laughs> it, it has been a very red state and uh, for quite some time. And outside of Atlanta, it's super fucking red and redneck. And, and that's just kind of mm -hmm. how it is. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you get into like what Savannah and Atlanta, you get around the more urban areas and, and you start seeing, you know, a typical like like any other state. You start seeing, you know, higher education levels, higher earning powers. You start seeing them uh, typically being more blue. Um, but then you get outside of that and you have the whole rest of the state of Georgia. And that's why a lot of these states in the South consistently stay red. Um, mm. uh, Trump knew this. That's the reason he went to the Republican Party to to run for president mm -hmm. was because he, he wanted to count on that rule vote. Because individually, like a town of 15,000 or whatever, doesn't hold a lot of power. But when 14,000 of them vote for a candidate and 1,000 don't, you know, collectively, they hold great power in this country. Yeah, uh, makes a lot of sense, dude. And, and, and that's where we're at. And, and some of the things, uh, like there's close races in Arizona, Nevada, Washington even. Um, Colorado's got a close one there. I think it's Bobert's position that's super close. Um, <clears throat> Michael Bennett and Joe O'Day, that's for... Um... That's pretty close. It looks like too. Here, so one to uh, really watch out for Scott is Wisconsin. So uh, Wisconsin's yeah. got an incumbent Democratic governor, mm -hmm. right? Oh, let me go ahead. Ron and John. Oh wait, wait. Is this uh, Ron Johnson versus Mandela Barnes? Yeah, let me pull up the I the Wisconsin governor here. Going. So Tony Evers is the incumbent Democrat. Oh, this must be another right. one. He's running okay. against Tim Michaels. This is the governor of Wisconsin. Okay, gotcha. Um, Michaels is polling up about about four point four, right? Half a point uh -huh. ish. Um, here's the interesting thing: the Republican-dominated Senate and House of Wisconsin has already said that they think that they will have enough changeover this election to veto-proof their houses so that even if tony evers gets elected and vetoes something that the republicans are doing as far as legislation 
um, they will have the three quarters or seven tenths or whatever it is in their state uh, to mm-hmm. overrule his veto and push the legislation through without a governor's signature. And mm-hmm. they're talking about giving the Senate and the House control over the delegate votes, regardless of the election results. Essentially, making it to where the local state picks who they're going to elect for Senate, for House, and for President outside of the voters' actual tallied votes and wishes. Um, that sounds undemocratic, if you ask me. You know what I mean? I, I don't I don't know to sounds say about tough. it, but it, it came from their mouth. Interesting. <laughs> I'll have to find it. If I can find it during the show, I will. But if I want to say it was the, the majority speaker... Uh, the 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 Senate Majority Leader of Wisconsin that was saying hmm. this, uh, so th- that's the kind of things that are coming out in this vote too. So it's not just who's going to win the House, who's going to win the Senate, because we already talked about this like a year ago, you know, uh, or even when Biden won. Like we we said that it doesn't matter. In two years, we mm-hmm. we showed the history for like forty years worth, and almost every single time uh, uh, a party wins the presidency, the next midterm the other party gains control of the house and the Senate. Well, you know, and it's, and it's interesting too, because up until recently, it looked like maybe we might be wrong, right? Like maybe, maybe the Supreme court helped shoot the Republicans in the foot for a minute. But as we got closer and closer to the election, the polls started to swing back in the Republicans favor again, because what everybody's focused on right now. And what's funny is the Democrats are talking about abortion and women's right. But what's affecting everybody is the economy immigration to a large degree right and and things like that so um again you know it's 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 swinging back the other way even though there was some resistance for a little bit but mainly what the republicans or excuse me the democrats are campaigning on right now is women's rights and abortion but let's be honest dude i don't want to be a dickhead but that doesn't affect everybody like it affects like people with with pain at the pump and like inflation and this and that you know it's so it's just not as big of an issue to as many people Scott, it's also an issue that hopefully can be addressed later. Like inflation needs to be addressed now. People are like losing their houses and shit. People can't Mm -hmm. afford to eat. Like Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's a pretty drastic priority, you know, uh, when you're talking about women's rights and it's very important. And I'm a very much a, a, a champion of women's rights and to, to take the government out of my medical decisions entirely, no matter what it is. But, (laughs) but with a big, but. And we like those, but it's not with the urgency of hurting every American's pocketbook right now. That is, right. That's what I mean is there's just more people. And some people are like, yeah, women's rights. That's great. We need to do something about this now. And it's the stuff that needs attention right now that's taking precedent. And and that's really going to be what's going to what people are going to be poking off, focusing on when they vote. Yeah. And it's only going to get worse, dude. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. There we're looking at a diesel fuel outage coming in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, that could skyrocket inflation even more because of the cost of, of, uh, infrastructure and and the, uh, shipping and getting everything from, you know, uh, market to the store, like, uh, or farm to market or whatever. Um, that whole, uh, supply chain issue is going to potentially go up if we have a diesel shortage like that. Like, what are we looking at then? Um, if, if the supply is going to drastically increase the diesel because there's there are, uh, 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 because of the demand is going to be so high, who's going to pay for that? You know, it's going to be the consumer. Right. And, and the other thing too, is like for a minute there, there was a little bit of breathing room, almost like it gave them a little bit of like space, right. With the inflation reduction act, but let's just look at this last job report. Okay, jobs were up a little bit from what was forecasted, but inflation was also up a little bit more again. So you got people that were kind of like using that as kind of one of their their campaign notes, right? Their campaign checks. And then, you know, again, like just people aren't they're they're not feeling it right now. So it is interesting. It is interesting because I, I I wouldn't I would I'll be really interested on Tuesday. One, here's the other thing. I'm gonna be interested to figure out or see when we figure out when when each state is settled on the vote. Because you know damn well, Tuesday night at midnight, Pennsylvania is not going to have a verdict. We just know this is not no, going to be the slow, case. They're a slow vote counting state. Um, oh, there's yeah, a few slow, states. Slow votes. Yeah, that's what we'll call there, There's like, a few states like that. I think 
I think Arizona is going to be like that. It's going to take a couple of days. Georgia is going to be like that. But you I know what's so funny? Too. What's interesting is all the pivotal swing states seem to be slow at voting, like tallying votes. Everybody else, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, could do it a hell of a lot quicker, which is kind of interesting to me. A yeah, little uh, sus, as I the was, kids say. I was watching Meet the Press this morning. And uh, they were talking about some of the keys that you can kind of key into to see the red waves early indicators or yeah. um, Indiana. Indiana is a quick vote counting state. Um, they're just quick. We'll probably know the night of uh, with Indiana. I, I, I don't know if it's because they count their absentee or their pre votes before. Um, but many states don't like Pennsylvania, for instance, they're not allowed to start counting votes until election Tuesday. Why? That's, that's their law. That's their state law. Um, but but they, what, I, what I just, I'm not asking you like pushing you and, and like getting combative here, but I wonder why they have that rule. Like why, why does that even make sense? If you have the votes, they're turned in, they're turned in legitimately officially start fucking counting the bitches. Let's not let the rest of the country fucking go ape shit and start like screaming fraud and everything because you're still dang dude. It's tantric voting fraud esque kind of feelings that, that are going on with this kind of shit. I don't like it. I, I don't know, man, but, but they have a red Senate and a red house. So like, well, I've got a red ass. What are you gonna say? <laughs> well, Pennsylvania's vote counting gives me the red ass. <laughs> hey, come on now. All right, so, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. So go ahead. Uh, uh, they, uh, they were just talking about Indiana and like um, there's a traditionally you know uh, you know red races there, red districts, but it's a matter of how much they actually win by. So mm -hmm. like if the margins at Indiana are less than they were a few years back or the last midterm in 2020. Uh, or 2018, uh, then that's kind of an indicator uh, of the temperature of the room, right? So Indiana might be a good one to watch out for. Um, mm -hmm. Did they did they bypass their margins or did they fall short of the margins of 2018? Um, and because uh, you know it's pretty much a solid red state, so that's an interesting one to look for. Because if you get um, if you're losing support in a pure red state like Indiana, then that's that's what early indicator from an an early vote counting state. Well, so that's something we can look for to kind of read the room on on tomorrow night or well, Tuesday night. <clears throat> I'll just say this. Kudos to the Hoosier state for having their shit together, counting votes, because I appreciate I appreciate some punctuality with vote counting. That's all I'm going to say. And I'll say this too, Bob. It seems to me, which I thought was interesting, and they, you know, both parties do this time and time again. But um, it looks like what what for a while the Republicans were complaining about the Democrats like using fame to like their advantage for like votes and stuff like that. You got Dr. Oz, Herschel Walker. You know what I mean? It's interesting this year. They're trying to just pull out some already pretty, pretty well-known folks to jump in the game, to push people out. Interesting, huh? Yeah. Um, I, I think they're all going to win. Um, right now I'm on real, real uh, clear politics. And right now they're showing pretty much locked up is 48 Republican seats and 48 Democrat seats with eight toss ups. Right. And out of those toss ups, uh, we've got this is the Senate. So uh, we got Kelly, who leads by like, uh, I think, a one point. Right. We've got oh. Bennett in Colorado, mm -hmm. who is up by five points. So mm -hmm. that's that's fair. Uh, we've got uh, the Warnock race in Georgia, which mm -hmm. Walker is up by point four uh, in, mm -hmm. in the polls. You know, grain of salt polls are, you know, not always true. Um We've got a New Hampshire race uh, where Maggie Hassan is going against Don Bolduck, the Republican. Uh, Hassan's the incumbent. Hassan is up by 0.7. So, so there's really toss-ups there. We've got a Democratic seat in uh, Washington that's up for grabs. Um, she's got a three-point lead there. Uh, we've got uh, an open seat in Pennsylvania. And that's uh, the Dr. Oz and John Fetterman, which uh, it's, it's pretty much dead even. Oz is up by 0.1. So Look, I don't there. I don't know the legality here, but if this is true, it's kind of strange. And the Dr. Oz things, um, it troubles me a little bit because from my understanding, he's campaigning for Pennsylvania, but I believe he lives in New Jersey. Yeah, they're called corporate backers, dude. They just buy a house. This has been going on since the 1800s. They just buy a house and they move there and they run. Hmm. <laughs> the, the official political term since way back in the day has been a carpet bagger. That's a carpet bagger, huh? That's interesting. Well, Herschel Walker's no different. He didn't live where, in Georgia when he decided to run. Where does he? Where did he? Where did he? Does he live there now or no? I'm. I mean, I think you have to live there, at least own property there. 
Oh, okay. So Oz has property there now, but his main, his, his established residency is in New Jersey. Is that the case? That's interesting. Herschel Walker addresses his Texas residency while running for U.S. Senate seat in Georgia. And the seven women that he's paid for their abortions. So Jesus Herschel Christ. Walker has lived in Texas for the last, you know, forever. But you so, know what? Why run in Texas? There's no reason. There's no value to add another Republican to the ticket in Texas. We have that one locked up. Herschel, get your ass over to Georgia where you played fucking college football. And let's get this done. I like what they're doing there. Yeah, Positioning so- Mr. Walker like a chess piece. You know what I mean? Yeah, let's look at the Texas map. It looks like Greg Abbott's got that one firmly in place from Beto O'Rourke, which is a shame because personally, I think uh, I think Abbott's just a a, a tool and and the face of the Republican Party with like no real solutions to any of their problems. Well, I mean, and you're an O'Rourke fan, then is this what you're telling me? Uh, I th- I think he's just a better person that actually will try to address an issue with legislative action versus just simply hoping it'll go away. Like he's talked about getting the Texas infrastructure on the national infrastructure because they're the only state that's not part of the infrastructure. And they're the only state that kills people when it gets cold (laughs) because of it. Right. He's talked about addressing that. Um, He's talked about uh, changing some of the gun laws there in a Republican, you know, dominated state. He's talking about changing some of the gun laws there, uh, at least working with them and doing the things that they'd be willing to concede on uh, since the school shooting, whereas Greg Abbott really did nothing. Wait a minute, though. Beto's the one that was like, damn right, we're coming for your rifles and we're going to take you. (laughs) But again, get the fuck out of here with that shit, Beto. Doing something other than nothing. True, true. He is, though, in my mind, a sissy little Nancy boy. Get out of here, Beto. Get out. Hey, you know what? I, I'll, I'll say this. Um, who should who should um, I think I think Joe Rogan should run for office since he is now a proud resident of Austin, Texas. <laughs> he couldn't do worse than Greg Abbott. He, he can't. dude. That's what I'm no. trying to say. He look. Talk about immediate fan base. Like people love him there. You know what I mean? So I'd be interested. I bet you he would he would he would he would necessitate more red and blue support than either of these guys. I'm just saying. Yeah, they asked Greg Abbott about what he's gonna do about school shootings, but he didn't really have a leg to stand on. Oh wow. <laughs> thank you thank you bob's gonna be here all night make sure to tip your waitress my fucking god well bob i think with that little joke there that <laughs> that probably closes us out for the day oh my goodness but no seriously bob i think we are about out of time but what a fantastic show bob um it's it's great chatting with you it is it, it is interesting man i mean again there's there's a lot of to be continued kind of ideas from from our chat today that we're not going to know and but we have we have key indicators here that it's going to be a a red wave so to speak um do you a, a kind of parting here do you do you do you believe that both the house and the senate are going to be a republican majority here by 100 percent yeah 100 percent. yeah okay. both both the senate and the house i think the the i think the senate's probably going to get 53 seats mm-hmm. uh and flipping basically three or four of them Three, three of them right now uh, into their favor. And I think the House is going to lose about 20 seats uh, hmm. and and give up the control of that. But none of that really matters because it's not going to be a veto proof control. It's just kind of going to cause a lame duck presidency to where there will be no more legislation passed until the 2024 election. And those guys are just going to get paid to do fuck all except for, you know, send money to Ukraine. It sounds like a politician's dream. Get paid money to do fuck all. Let's just sit here and interview on, you know, Fox or CNN, depending on what party they're on and and not do anything actually tangible and and not push legislation through. And even if something gets through, it's going to get vetoed and you're not going to be able to overturn it. Mm -hmm. And like I said, not shit is going to happen after this goes down, which I don't know. Typically is going to lead to some probably some public unrest in 2024. So that'll be the real interesting thing. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a lot of the same, unfortunately. It's always the same. There we go. Which is swing, which swinging is, our way back to the same, which is why we mentioned the whole last 40 year thing. The last time we talked about the midterms. Well, <clears throat> just so everybody knows, I, I, I got out there and voted already. And guess what? I did not do. I didn't do much voting of of red and blue. I voted gold. So there you go. I wasted my vote. You like that? 
Go fuck I off. Do. I do. Enjoy yourself. I do like that. <laughs> I will tell you what, though. There was a lot more. Op- there was a lot more options for me to vote gold, which I was pretty pleased. It it still is a little bit discouraging that nearly 45, 50 percent of the ballot. I don't have the opportunity to do anything but Republican or Democrat. But that's where we are. And that's the American political system. So, hey, oh, <laughs> anyways, thanks, guys, for joining us today. Um, really do appreciate all the love and support. Check us out next week for another exciting show here on The Stiff Truth. Uh, I think we're getting into uh, some some stuff here that, that Bob wants to share with everybody. I don't know. I'm just going to throw that out there. Some personal stuff for Bob, right? Yeah, I, I love personal <laughs> stuff for Bob. <laughs> Until next time, guys, enjoy the rest of your weekend. We love you all. We'll talk to you soon. See ya.